Yeah. It's just there is a button a small button on the top. Sorry, everybody. Hey, Bob. and then we'll get to the talk. Um, so first, um, Prabhupada Pranamantra, Nama Om Vishnupadaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Ekinamane, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pachanane, Nishvishesha Sundaradi, Paschintya Desha Tarane. Then to our Guru, uh, Om Ajnana Timirandasya, Jnananjana Shalakaya, Chakshur Ummilitam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Shri Chaitanya Vano Vishnan Stavitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Tada Mayam Dadati Swa Padantikam. The next prayer is for uh, Shri Rupa Goswami and all the other Goswamis. Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Uta Pada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha. He Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bando Jagatpate, Gopesha Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta Namostute. Tapta Kanchana Gaurange, Radhe Vrinda Ganeshpuri, Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya. And prayers to all the Vaishnavas assembled here. Vacha Kalpa Tarubhyascha, Kripa Sindhu Ke Evacha, Patitanam Pavanevyo, Vaishnavevyo Namo Namaha. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shrivas Adi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Okay, thank you all. So, um, <coughs> so in our, our, why does it not go to Okay. Um, in our tradition, we acknowledge that we are um, a, a tiny part in a very, very long lineage of uh, exalted, wonderful, glorious teachers. This is why we have so many prayers as part of our Mangalajan, uh, because our intelligence is tiny, but we can we stand on the shoulders of giants. The books that Srila Rupa Goswami gave inspired Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And the books that Bhakti Vinod Thakur wrote inspired Bhakti Siddhanta Saswati Thakur. And the books and magazine that he wrote inspired our dear Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada made it accessible. So when we speak, we speak not on our own strength, but on the strength of all these wonderful teachers who are far ahead of their time. Now we have so much technology. Um, Srila Prabhupada, has anybody uh, typed on a typewriter? You guys won't know. Even you won't know, but you all know how hard it is. You can't delete, cut, copy, paste. You have to start all over again. And all of them wrote when they had far fewer resources than what we have at our disposal today. And with those meager resources, I, I think all of you remember the talk that Sutapa Prabhu, now uh, Swayam Bhagwan uh, Keshav Maharaj gave, that they had to write on palm leaves and they had to wait for the ink to dry. They would have to write on the repeat page, uh, palm leaf. Um, so we really have no excuse. We have all of this at our disposal. 
if people who had far fewer resources could accomplish so much, the least we can do is to at least read. Read, reflect, and try to apply in our life and become better human beings. So, so with that note, we'll start with um, chapter 16. Um, it's, um, I was hoping to um, share my realizations about this, and this is going to be our schedule. We're going to discuss the verses until 12.05. I'm going to channel my inner Sunday school teacher role and give you all some, not a homework, but it's like a writing assignment for 10 minutes, 12.05 uh, to 12.15. And then we'll end at 12.15 and take uh, reflections, comments, questions from the group. Okay? Just like Sunday school, this is going to be very interactive. I'm not going to be here droning on and on. So, okay. So, as we all know, Gita is a storehouse of enduring wisdom that's influenced many thinkers over the ages, whether it's uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Albert Einstein, so many people to this day, we all seek solace from the Gita. If you, uh, have you all had this experience where you're in a crunch, you're in a problem situation, and you flip open the Gita, and that is something that, that gives you hope and uplifts you. So that's the kind of book. It's not like the books we read in college. It's relevant. Like, in medical school, the books you read are relevant to medicine. But Gita is relevant to everything, for all the roles we have, as an individual, as a professional, as a parent, as a devotee serving in a community. No matter what your role is, the Gita has something for you. That's the kind of very, very special book it is. So we have to think about um, how does a book endure the test of time for over 5,000 years, right? There's so many books that was very hot when we were reading. We don't even remember those titles now. But this book has somehow endured that test. So why is that? Um, it, of course, it's Krishna's words. Krishna has spoken those words. But another additional factor, in my humble opinion, is also the questions that Arjuna asked. If Arjuna asked, should I fight or should I not fight? And then Krishna showed his universal form in chapter 11 and said, I am God. I'm telling you to fight. Case closed. Okay. Then I don't know whether we'll be reading the book today. Because now we have precision missiles, we have stealth missiles, we have drones that can fire from the US to somewhere else. Killing has become very impersonal. We don't need to, there's no face to face combat anymore. People might question is this even relevant? But Arjuna asked a very foundational question. He asked, What's my duty? He didn't ask whatever was relevant to that situation. Should I fight or not fight? He asked, What's my duty? And that is why we are studying the Gita today. Because we all have to answer that question in our life every day. What is my role? What is my contribution? What is my duty? So it's very um, important that we think about how we, as we reflect, what are the questions that come to our mind. Because Krishna appreciates critical thinking in a devotee. He's a very secure God. He's not like, I just showed you the Vishwarupa. What are you asking? Chapter 11, Gita should be done, right? There are seven more chapters. Krishna keeps asking questions. Sorry, Arjuna keeps asking questions and Krishna keeps giving answers. So Krishna didn't say, I just showed you I'm God. I just showed you that um, the battle, the decision of the battle is how it's going to happen. And Arjuna didn't say, oh, Krishna says, uh, Nimitta Matram, all these warriors have been put to death by my arrangement. Just be an instrument. I can just go back. He didn't do that. So Krishna really appreciates critical thinking in a devotee. And Arjuna asks all these questions, not for his benefit, but for our benefit, but for our benefit. So, so we also need to uh, think very critically about how do the teachings of the Gita apply to the station in life that we are in, the roles in life that we have, and, and go from that. So, um, and so when we read the Gita, we need to know the context. So when we read a verse, we have to ask ourselves, Krishna is giving this answer, but what was the question that Arjuna asked that made Krishna give this answer? Just like a storybook, when you read a book, imagine, would you ever read a novel smack in the middle? You wouldn't, right? You would start from the beginning to the end. And sometimes when you reread novels, you already know how the plot ends. And that makes it even, um, it gives you a different perspective when you read. So it's very critical when we read a verse that we need to know what's the context. If we, if we do not bring this uh, systematic, um, critical thinking approach to the Gita, then the books in the Gita will not be a living, breathing text for us. Sometimes we can listen to a lot of talks, and then it just becomes information. 
There's a difference when knowledge is information versus knowledge becoming wisdom. Reciting shlokas upside down, right, backward, forwards, that's all information. But when we think deeply about it, we reflect upon it, we make, we apply it, we make a very intentional, deliberate effort to say, I am not where the Gita wants me to be. It's very lofty, but I want to take one step in the right direction. And that's what translates into vinyan. From jnana, it becomes vinyan or realized knowledge or wisdom. And that's what Srila Prabhupada has given us. And um, before many of you came, we were talking about how Srila Prabhupada, with very few resources, compiled all these books. And that the least we can do is to at least read them, read and apply them. So hopefully that's um, a humble attempt in uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, and also when we read the Gita, um, we, we can always think of a macro level and then drill down to a micro level. And we can think about uh, what does the Gita teach us in terms of um, Krishna consciousness as the way Srila Prabhupada presented to us. Okay. And um, this is something that I adapted from uh, His Holiness Swayam Bhagavan uh, Keshav Maharaj's talk. Uh, there are five C's in, uh, that the Gita teaches us. And the first one is character. Sadacha, Vaishnava Sadacha, or character in general. And that is the foundation for everything that we do. And in the Chaitanya Chantamrita, all of you would know the verse, I don't know the verse, but uh, uh, Rupa Goswami tells Haidas Thakur, some people are good in preaching, but they are not good in character. Some people are good in character, but they are not good at preaching. You, however, are good in both. You are great and you have exalted character, exemplary character, and you are an excellent teacher. And that's why, to me, Sarva Guru, to me, Sarva Guru, he says that. So um, that's the injunction that we all need to follow. No matter what we do, it starts with the foundation of character. Because our char there are two things that determine how we conduct ourselves in this world, our emotions. One is our circumstances and the other is our character. We can't choose our circumstances. Life is going to throw bricks at us and it won't be pleasant. But we can choose the kind of character we develop. And when we stand on that rock of character, the circumstances won't matter because we have that as our immunity to, to face. So the Gita has so many verses. When you, whenever we see a verse that's repeated many times, we can learn that Krishna is saying that for emphasis. You'll find the same things repeated in the 12th chapter, 16th chapter, 17th chapter, 18th chapter. Why is Krishna saying this so many times? Because he knows this is important and to get through our thick skulls, sometimes things have to be emphasized a lot. And character is one of those things that Krishna puts a lot of emphasis on. And the next one is community. We all just came off our biggest festival, Janmashtami. Every single member of the community, some of you worked tirelessly for weeks on end, planning hours and meetings. Some of us just showed up that day and did whatever service was needed. But regardless, every single member put in their best, um, extended themselves to make it a grand success. And uh, many of us, when we do the same amount of work at work, we know how it feels. It's not very, um, it's work, it's not very joyful. Whereas in Janmashtami, even though we were physically bone tired, we were still very refreshed at the end. That's the difference between work in Krishna consciousness and when you work for a salary or for fame. Um, and, um, and the Gita tells us how do we conduct ourselves in a community. Okay. And whether we like it or not, we are all part of some community this community, work community, our community and family, um, so that we are all not uh, solitary individuals, we are part of a community. And the third thing is culture. Um, when I say culture, I don't just mean how we dress, what kind of food we eat, but how do we conduct ourselves with other people? And um, how, how is our lifestyle? How is our routine? Our life is a bunch of routines pieced together. And we all can honestly look internally and ask ourselves how our culture was before we were introduced to Srila Prabhupada and the Gita and how it is now. And when we uh, admire someone, the first thing we think about them is that they are either a perfect gentleman or a wonderful lady. So even outside a devotional community, those values are placed at a very high premium, how, you, how cultured we are and how we conduct ourselves. And the Gita has a lot about that. And when devotees uh, congregate, what should they talk about? The Gita has a prescription for that too. 
And the last one is, if you have strong character, you're part of a very good community, and you are very cultured, nat the natural thing that will flow from that is contribution. What can I contribute to this community? I'm taking a lot, but what can I give? That's the natural result. And, and we have to think deeply about how do our skills and expertise, how best can we serve Srila Prabhupada and his mission? We all do something, um, whether it's small or whether it's big, but it has to be something unique to Srila Prabhupada's mission that we have to contribute, our skills and expertise. For all what we've got, we, we need to give back. And the Gita talks about what is the mood in which you contribute. Because even contribution in the devotional aspect can sometimes lead us to a path of, I did this so much, or nobody acknowledged me, nobody said that what I did was so good. We can easily get tricked into all those things. So we have to, and the Gita tells us, Nirmama Nirahankara, what's the consciousness in which you contribute? So there's a prescription for that. And then the final C is connection. You can be in a temple full of 100 people and still feel very alone. if You don't have that internal connection. And that's what Srila Rupa Goswami in his uh, Nectar of Devotion, Nectar of Instruction talks about the relationships we built. At the end of the day, if we deeply think about it, we may have accumulated a lot of uh, wealth, we may have accomplished a lot in our life, but n none of that will come with us at the end. At the end, it's the people that we meet along the way, the relationships that we built, that when we are in trouble, that we have at least 10 people that we can call and, and share that 10 people will come and show up for us when we need something. That's what matters. And that comes from connection. And that connection comes from contribution. When you contribute, you're, part of the, you're physically part of the community. You're virtually part of the community. And that attracts you to like-minded individuals, people who are in the same consciousness as you. And that's how we build connection. So the Gita touches on all five uh, topics. So let's see. We need to go. keep going. So. Um, we are going to read the first five verses, first three verses in chapter 16, but before that we need to know what was the question that Arjuna asked. Okay. So I'm going to ask a volunteer to read the Sanskrit, and we are going to conduct this like Sunday school. If you don't volunteer, you'll be drafted. Okay. So you have five seconds. So, anyone? Rahul? Oh, Kirti Okay. Okay. Read the Sanskrit, yeah. And Can I have someone louder to read the English translation? Parikshit, please. Oh, my dear Lord, my lips and tongues is one known who is transcendental to these three modes. What is his behavior? How do they transcend the modes of nature? This is after... Mahini Kishori Mataji, please come here. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. It's a brief interruption in the video. It doesn't matter. So, um, so this is the question that Arjuna asked, well after the universal form is shown, and he's still asking, uh, well, you're, you keep saying that someone who's self-realized will act in this way, but how will I know who is self-realized? How do they act? How do they transcend the modes of nature? And the remaining verses in the 14th chapter, Krishna answers that. All of 15th chapter, he answers that. And then 16th chapter, he answers the question, what is his behavior? Krishna asks, Arjuna asks, what is his behavior? Krishna answers that in the 16th chapter, okay? So I want a different uh, volunteer, but uh, you'll see that Prabhupada entitled this chapter Divine and Demoniac Natures. He didn't say divine and demoniac people. He didn't say that. He acknowledges that divine and demoniac natures are present in each one of us. In different yugas, maybe they were in two different camps, but this is Kali Yuga. And in the morning, we may be divine, and in the afternoon, we'll be demoniac, okay? And he acknowledges that. And there is nuance to this. This is why Prabhupada, you, when you see the titles of the chapter, there's a lot of uh, poignancy and meaning in how he wrote the title of the chapter. So let's see. Can I have a volunteer, um, Sri Krishna? Read. She will read the translation. Yeah. Sri Bhagavan Vacha 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 Mm -hmm. 
the four. Okay. Dushi, you want to read the remaining ahimsa from now? Longer, longer, Dushi. Thank you all. Okay. I want one adult or quasi adult to read the synonyms. Okay. doing this to keep it interactive. I don't think you want to hear me drone on and on. So can I have another volunteer to read the whole translation? How many of you are still feeling hopeful at the end of this translation? When I first read this, I thought, okay, it's going to take 100 more lifetimes for me. But, um, but that gives us a pass if we think like that, because then it's not putting, making us take any effort to at least develop one or two of these in one lifetime. So, um, okay. So, um, Hare Krishna. So, um, Devi Sampadam or divine qualities are 26 in nature. Okay? And um, sometimes when you look at this list, it can feel very overwhelming. So, you can think of it as what are the qualities that are very straightforward? There's no other way to say simplicity and gentleness. We all know what simplicity is. We all know what being gentle and kind is. But then there are some qualities that are in the modes of nature. There are some qualities that can be in goodness, that can be in tamasic and uh, rajasic. Okay. So, um, so that's why I tried to categorize into two groups. Okay. The next slide will show you the qualities in the three modes. And this one uh, lists everything. Okay. So the first one is abhayam or fearlessness. Um, how many of us have at least had fleeting glimpses of Abhayam since we've come to Krishna consciousness? It's hard to be Abhayam all the time, but at least fleeting glimpses, we know what that feels like. Okay? When Srila Prabhupada was asked, what do you feel when you chant? What do you feel? His response was, I feel fearless. Okay? That his connection with the holy name was so potent that when he chanted the uh, holy name, his reaction was, I feel fearless. 
thing. There's a difference between being fearless and reckless. That doesn't mean, oh, I'm fearless, I can do everything. That's not what Krishna is saying. Krishna is not encouraging recklessness. But um, there are times when if you are very fearful, your brain doesn't work, you're in a panic mode, you really aren't thinking through things. Um, but when you try to divorce the emotion from the actual situation and attempt to be fearless, then the, the mind is clear and you can at least take the next step. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu talks a lot about that. When all the lights go off and you're dark and you don't know what, to happen, what happens next, and uh, some of us may not have been there and some of us may have felt that in our lives, that we've had some situations where we didn't even know what to do next, where to turn next just a complete shutdown in, in what you are doing in your life. And at that time, the Gita is like a flashlight. Take the next step. Don't worry about this whole problem being solved. But what is the next tangible step you can take? And to do that, you have to have some fearlessness to take that next step. And then the way will be shown, the path will be shown as we take the step. But we can't stay here in the dark and say, until the whole path is revealed, I'm not taking a step. We can't do that. So, and it's very uh, interesting that Krishna opens the verse with the word Abhayam. How many of us have noticed that um, in the beginning when we come to Krishna consciousness, we are so joyful. And after that something happens. Then we run to the astrologer, we run to that uh, portion, this portion, this drink, that something to... We have the holy name. That has everything. We have Gita, we have Bhagavatam, we have Srila Prabhupada's books. That has everything. That tells us that maybe internally we are not yet, we have yet not yet developed that fearlessness. And it's hard to be fearless all the time, but when it matters, we have to be. And we have to make a conscious effort to develop those qualities. So that's one. And then Sattva Samasuddhir is purifying one's existence. And, um, and purity is our only immunity against what life throws at us. Even in devotional communities, sometimes we will find ourselves in situations where we are at the receiving end of criticism and negativity. Again, going back to what I said, the circumstance and character, we can't control what the other person tells. We, we simply can't. We can barely control our own mind. In Japa, barely control our own mind, somehow get through it, focus. What makes us think we can control what the other person says? We can't. But when we develop purity of intention, purity of thought and action, that is our only immunity against whatever anyone says or whatever life throws at us. So that's something for us to remember. And then uh, controlling the mind. Each of these can be talked about it for one hour. That's how poignant each of these virtues are. So for the sake of time, and to make sure you all have a chance to do the homework at 12.05, we're going to wrap it up. And um, just pick and choose certain things, OK? Swadhyaya is study of Vedic literature. And uh, this topic has been discussed a lot in 2022, so I'm not going to belabor the point. The only thing I would leave you all with, with my personal realization, is to say, no matter how many lectures we listen to, there has to be some uh, time dedicated, even if it's 10 minutes, for us to read Shri Prabhupada's books. And for us to write one or two sentences about, because we read that verse today, what are we going to change the way we do? That connection has to be that. Even if we read for five minutes, we have to reflect upon it and write. So that, uh, to me, is what uh, I take it from study of Vedic literature. And then simplicity. Prabhupada told us, simple living, high thinking. Um, we, um, we, uh, ha for the last two decades, most of us have lived here in the West. We are very used to accumulating a lot of things. And you know that when your basement floods, which happened to us recently. And you're like, why? Why did we do all this, right? So it's important for us to keep stock of when we are accumulating too much. And then uh, ahimsa or non-violence is very important. How many of us think that vegetarianism is ahimsa? How many of you think vegetarianism alone is ahimsa? No, I see Rajapati Mataji vigorously shaking her head. Just because we are vegetarian doesn't mean we are practicing ahimsa. When we hurt people with our words, when we don't help other people who are toiling physically in their service, we pass by. And that is also ahimsa. That is violence by, by our speech, violence with our body, violence with our mind. Just because we adopt a, a, a vegetarian diet and, and all that, that alone is not ahimsa. So that is external. That's what others see. 
and we always have to ask ourselves in Krishna consciousness beyond what others see. I know what I am inside. And do I really practice Ahimsa? And even in our mind, if we use hurtful words against others, that is also a subtle form of Ahimsa. And we have to uh, be very self, uh, not critical, but um, introspective. We have to be introspective. When we read all these books, it should show in our character how we conduct ourselves to the uh, external world. And Satyam truthfulness, that is self-explanatory. And then there are uh, some words here, Akrodaha and Adrohaha. Sanskrit is kind of a language where it's very logical, it's very mathematical. Krodha means anger, a Krodha means freedom from anger. Just like we would say in English, normal, abnormal, right? So you have a predictable pattern in English, you have a very predictable pattern in Sanskrit. So freedom from anger. And, and then you can say, Mataji, it's very hard not to be angry. There's always nuances to every situation. But we know when we were genuinely angry and when we were out of control. We know that, right? So this is, these are all virtues, not for me to tell Rahul, look at all this checkbox. You didn't follow all this. This is for us to look at ourselves and say, how are we faring on this checklist? Okay. So freedom from anger. Shanti is tranquility. Again, also self-explanatory. And this is very, very important in a devotional community. Aversion to fault finding. Sometimes out of the blue, someone will come and say, you could have done this way. Or we, self, we ourselves tell to others, please, let's make a conscious effort to not do that. Because whatever service the other person is doing, they've thought through that. There is a time and place to give feedback. And when that person is receptive, when we are in a place of authority that we can actually give feedback, these are all the circumstances. But we have to be very cognizant. You've heard the term familiarity breeds content. <coughs> Sometimes that can happen in devotional communities because you see them every week, you take them for granted. Next thing you know, you've crossed that line and start finding faults. And that's the beginning of the end of devotional service because inadvertently we are committing offenses. And Dhaya Bhuteshu, mercy to, Prabhupada says mercy to all living entities, not just mercy to devotees. Okay. So we have to have an open mind. Uh, that we are one way to people here, another way to people outside, that we are judgmental to other people. No. This is mercy to all living entities. We come from the lineage of Gaurnitai. We come from the lineage of uh, Gaurnitai giving mercy to Jagai and Madai. So who are we to discriminate against others? So, so that is very important. And then freedom from greed. I already told about the basement flood saga. You know how much you accumulate when uh, things like that happen. Mardavam is gentleness. Even when we want to say something that's unpleasant, it's the tone in which we speak or deliver that makes it palatable to the other person. And Hrihihi is modesty, how we dress, um, how we present ourselves. There's a dress code everywhere. You go to work, there's a dress code there. When I go see patients, there's a dress code that I wear. When I'm not seeing patients, I'm in my office, there's a different dress code. It's a similar thing when we come to the temple, there's also a dress code. There's nothing rigid or regimental or puritanical or pat patriarchal about that. It's just that. There's a dress code to, depending on the place you go. And we just need to follow that. And uh, Tejaha is vigor. All our devotees exhibited a lot of vigor on Janmashtami. I know of devotees who spent until 2 a.m. and then the next day came and uh, washed dishes and were here until 6 p.m. That is vigor. You can't do that without energy. That takes a lot of energy. And, um, and next is Shama, forgiveness. Despite all what I said, even when people hurt us, it's important that we don't hold grudges. And first thing I'll say is I don't practice any of this. I'm trying to practice. But I've learned that when you hold a grudge, it actually hurts you more. And at some point, it's better to let go and let go of resentment. Uh, Sauchum is cleanliness, not just physical cleanliness of the environment, how we keep our temple clean how we keep our home, workspace clean, but also uh, hygiene in terms of our body and cleanliness of thought. And, and then the last one is, we already touched upon freedom from envy. If someone else is doing well, to be genuinely happy for them and not to compare. That this is a big thing from, from where we come from, that we always compare ourselves with someone better than us or lower than us, and we either feel great or we feel horrible. So let's stop that. We are unique in Krishna's eyes. And, uh, and last one is not expecting any honor. To just do our service because as Rajabhakti Mataji always says, one person knows and that is Krishna. 
whether anyone knows or not, whether anyone acknowledges or not, Krishna knows. And that's enough for us. And then, um, how are we doing on time? We have two more minutes. Okay. Uh, divine qualities in the three modes of material nature. Of course, we don't have time to go through all of this, but the other qualities that Krishna mentions, Krishna goes on to elaborate in subsequent chapters. For example, when you say uh, austerity, uh, how does austerity of the body look like? How does austerity of the mind look like? How does it look like for speech? When you talk about knowledge, what is knowledge in uh, goodness? What is knowledge in ignorance? What is knowledge in uh, passion or frenzied activity? So Krishna goes through a lot of trouble to explain all this. So this is just for reference. If those who are interested, you can uh, learn more from that. So up until now, we talked about the divine qualities, which are 26 in nature. How many do you think are the demoniac qualities? I want a guess. Uh, Premlas Prabhu says three. This is now looking like the auction at Radhashti. OK, who said eight? Eight. Eight, OK. Um, Mataji's give a number. There are 26 divine qualities. How many do we need? How many d demoniac qualities do, would we have? Less than divine. Less than divine. Good. That's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's all, life is always like that, right? To be good, you have to do a lot more work. But to be bad, with just a few, you can wreak enough damage. Yeah. So any other takers? Any number? Four. Four. Yes, sir. Three. That number is already taken. Okay. It's between three and eight. It's actually uh, six. Okay. Oh, sorry, Parikshit. I didn't see. Yeah. Um, it's six qualities. Okay. And um, the first one is pride. Okay. So in, in contemporary vernacular, and here when we grow up, we always tell our children, or not tell our children, uh, I'm proud of you for doing that. Right. That's a different pride than the pride that Krishna talks about. Here the pride is where you feel entitled, that I'm doing all this, I'm so proud, and what do you know? Like that, putting people down. That's what Krishna is advising against when he says pride. And the Sanskrit word is dhamba for that. And once you're pr proud, then the natural consequence of that is arrogance. I know it all. Who are you? I know it all. And that is dhappa. Okay. So that's the second, uh, uh, Prabhupada says that these six qualities describe the, I'm quoting Prabhupada here, okay, describe the royal road to hell. That's what Prabhupada <laughs> says. Just for emphasis, if you didn't get the point, that one sentence should tell us, okay. And the next is conceit. When we are proud and arrogant, we don't tend to respect the contributions that others are making. And that's horrible. So that's conceit. And the word for that is abhimanaha. And the fourth one is anger, krodha. We talked about it before. The divine qualities is akrodha. So, of course, the demonic qualities should be krodha. And harshness is parushya. Okay. Everyone who's had a teenager or a preteen will know what that means. Okay. <laughs> you can tell the same point to your child. And if you say it the wrong way, that's it. It's gone. Okay. But uh, I don't mean to pick on you. It's just a general statement. Um, so, um, and, and, it, and kids who are born of us, if that's the expectation they have, imagine how we should conduct ourselves with people outside, that we don't even have a biological relationship with. So even when we want to say something, we need to, Ramkita Prabhu one time gave this uh, in, in a class, that when you are trying to give some feedback, you have to ask yourself three questions. Am I the right person to give the feedback? Meaning, am I in a position of authority? And second question is, is the person in a mental state that's ready to receive the feedback? And the third question is, even if they are ready, are they ready to receive it from me? You have to ask all these three questions. And if the answer is a resounding no, <laughs> go approach someone, ask, tell them, and let them deal with that. Okay? Because there are people who are naturally good at it. Um, if you look at, uh, if you work in a large corporation, you'll see the HR people, their voice is so smooth. They can give the worst bad news in the world, but they will say it in like this radio tone music, or musical voice, right? So, and Krishna says here, harshness is, is, is a demoniac nature. Okay, so we have to be very careful, and even if we are saying the right thing, if we say it in a harsh way, that person will not see what you're saying. Because you've already taken away their dignity by speaking to them so rudely. They, they, they aren't listening to what you're saying. They, they just know what, how you made them feel. 
and His Holiness Aradhanath Maharaj, he says that people may not remember the words you said, but they will remember how those words made them feel. Have any of you had an experience where you have family members who haven't talked to each other for 20 years? Of something that happened 20 years ago, no one remembers, but they're still fighting, and that continues from generation to generation. It's because of that, being harsh. So it, words have consequences. So we have to be careful. And the last one is uh, ignorance or anyana. And when we are ignorant about our true identity, when we are not introspective, then we tend to commit all these uh, offenses. Okay. So um, I am six minutes behind schedule. So everyone, pick up your cell phone. Don't go on WhatsApp. Okay. This is an activity. Go to this uh, website called menti.com. Okay. I know your muscle memory is like, let me go check my text messages, WhatsApp. That's not what we are going to do, okay? We are instead going to go to this website, uh, Krish Prabhu, Krishna Smaran Prabhu. So, and put this code, 66923427, okay? 3427. And before you start typing, hear the question first, okay? Presentation. You, you do it. So, did everyone open their, uh, Alankar Prabhu has an excuse, if someone can give him my phone. Did everyone open the website and put the code in, then I'll tell you the question. Six six nine two three four two seven. Okay, now, now think about, three four two seven. Now think about a person that you admire the most. He could be your um, Diksha Guru, a Siksha Guru. He may not even be part, he or she may not even be part of a devotee community. But if that person tells you, you will listen. You admire them so much. You feel like of all the people you know, this is a person who has flawless character and very high integrity. Okay. Think of a person like that. Okay. And once you, have you all visualized that person? Okay, and once you think of that person, write down the three qualities about them that makes you respect them so much. It may be from the list of 26, it may not be from that list, but write down three qualities in the individual that you most admire. Okay, someone wrote pure and motive, kind, they, are, they have vigor, tejaha, energetic. Okay, one soul has written three words, what about the rest? Okay, keep typing. And I'll know it's going to populate, okay? Listens, okay? It's very hard to do, we like to talk. It's hard to listen, okay? And truthfulness. Uh, Krishna Smaran Prabhu, does the word size mean anything? Yeah, if, if there are many people who have told kind, then the kind will become bigger. Bigger, okay, got that it. Is, that's the most uh, popular character. Okay. Did everyone write or people are still typing? Okay, so we see a logical truthfulness, very renunciate. Okay, wonderful, very loving, kind. kind. Someone said kind, yeah, Devik, yes, freedom from material desires, compassion, yes, compassion, supportive, love, love for Krishna, humility, advises, fearless, simplicity, reliable, yes, that is very important, reliable does not have enmity, is open, innocent, yep, good, okay, anyone still typing or maybe we can move on to the next question, okay, so the next question is, Krishna Swaram Prabhu, do I just hit next, okay, so the next question is, now you've learned the 26 qualities, you know what are the six demoniac qualities. You know what are the qualities you respect in someone. Now look at yourself and say what are the three qualities you want to develop consciously. That from today on you will make a conscious intentional effort. I want to develop these qualities. There is a group uh, going there. Sita Sundari Mataji, Mohini Kishori Mataji, Kapna Mataji are all one group. Okay. Okay, 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 no worries. 
So what are the three qualities you want to intentionally develop? Okay. I think someone meant to write not being harsh. I think that's what they meant to write. Um, some of you said fearlessness, some of you said sincerity, many of you said humility, yep, and humble, and love for Krishna, yes, eagerness to serve, yep, um, freedom from envy, wonderful. Okay, so far the Olympic gold goes to uh, humility, silver goes to fearlessness, and bronze goes to kindness, based on the size, okay. Many of you read, wrote control of anger. Thank you for whoever wrote that. There's a honest people here. Good. Um, tolerance. Reading. More efficient. Okay. Um, clean, soft, satisfied. Yes. Okay. Non judgmental. Yes. That is wonderful. Okay. You don't want to what, uh, what Devik? I don't want to get the arrogance. You don't want to get arrogance. Thank you, Devi. Haribo. Yes. We are all that. Yeah. Okay. So we are at 12.16, one minute delayed of schedule. So I'm going to pause here and um, we'll take some reflections, comments, uh, questions, and I'll try to uh, answer them to the best of my ability. If I can't, I will phone a friend and ask Premlas Prabhu, Ramthita Prabhu, and Vajagati Yeah. Okay. Either it was yes First of all, thank you so much for uh, preparing such wonderful presentation and sharing with all of us. It's gone, Mata. <laughs> okay, okay. So, no, first of all, thank you for preparing such wonderful presentations. Uh, really, and this especially that slide where we had all the verses from 17th chapter regarding different qualities. Um, my question was that we. I mean, these are the things we hear a lot of times, and uh, we, there are, like you said, you know, each of these points can have its own class by like itself. So. Um, but the thing is that we, there are the priorities in life. Sometimes you know, we say, that, okay, this is what I want to improve, but then some other priorities come, like you know, some things like burning house every day. So if the, all the houses are burning in the city, the fire department will, will go crazy, right? So. Like it's not that I have just one thing that I can priorities change this every day. Mm -hmm. Someday I feel like I want to be more clean or I want to have cleanliness. Then next day I'm late, I want to be more punctual. Then so it's like it keeps shifting and then at the end of the day, everything is still as it is. Mm -hmm. Um so if there is like one thing that you say, no, no forget everything, like you know, keep this as your priority, what would that be? What is out of all this, what is the most important uh, one that you have? And that will change for each person, probably. That I don't think it will be the same for everyone. Um, for me, as an individual, it would be uh, freedom from anger. As, as a person, as the person that I want to work on, it will be freedom from anger. Um, but for someone like Krishna Swaram Prabhu, who's not, who doesn't have that problem, it will be totally different. Right? So it, it varies from individual to individual. Um, I think the first, the the macro answer to your question is to first look at our life um, from a bigger view and see what's going on. For example, your priorities will change based on your station in life. So something might be a priority now. The beauty of life is it's a very iterative process. Let's say you come up with two priorities out of the 26. And then in a week from now, you figure out that that, is, that was not at all a priority for you in the past week. Okay. Then you can ask, why was that not a priority? Is it the structure of your life that prevents it? Let's say you picked study of Vedic literature, study of Srila Prabhupada books. Let's pick a tangible example. I want to read 10 minutes a day, but you didn't. And then you can ask yourself, why did I not do that? Was my life so busy that I don't have time? Um, or I have to prioritize between chanting and books, and I'm prioritizing chanting over books. And then you can see, what of this can be changed? Maybe my goal should be reading Srila Prabhupada's books at least three times a week. Maybe listening to Srila Prabhupada's books in my commute when I drive. Making it a more reachable goal, not such a lofty goal that you are left discouraged. 
uh, I don't remember the verse, but in the 11th canto in Srimad Bhagavatam, in Uddhava Gita, there's a verse that says that, uh, Krishna says, my devotees, although they know what is the ideal, and that is very lofty, and they know that they are not there yet, they know that they are not free from material desires, still do not get discouraged. That they, that they, that they preserve their optimism and enthusiasm for devotion service. So these qualities are not meant to beat ourselves up and say, I said this, it not, didn't happen, I'm worthless, blah, blah, blah. No. It's about why did it not happen? And having that time and space in your life to have that discussion with yourself or with someone else in your family or with some, some other friend. I don't know how uh, each person is different, how they organize themselves. For me and for Krishna Swaram Prabhu, the bulk of uh, time goes in thinking about how to do something. Once we think and come up with a plan, doing is the easy part. But when we don't have time to think, then the whole life is disorganized. So you have to ask yourself, where is my bulk of energy going to? Is it acting or thinking? And, and whatever you come up with, it has to be an iterative process. And assess yourself and say, why did it not work? Maybe I should pick something else or change something else or have low expectations. When you, how many of you have got a gym uh, subscription January 1st? How many of you have done that? How many of you stopped going to the gym after MLK Day? Right? That's how long we last, right? So that's why it's so hard to make and keep habits. People say that you have to do something every day for 30 days to make it a habit. And if we, and we flunk in the first two weeks. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it not happening? What can I do to be more realistic? So I build up my confidence and keep going on. Uh, the Gita is meant for a lifetime. Like in medicine, we have to take exams every 10 years. We have to do maintenance of certification tests every year. And the Gita is meant to be practiced every day, every year for the rest of our life. And even if you talk to people who've been practicing Krishna consciousness for 50 years, even they don't think that they've achieved it all. There's, there's always, the, the sky is literally the limit in Krishna consciousness. You think you've got it, you, there's still more. There's still more purification. You can still be more humble. You can still do more. So I think starting somewhere and sticking with that, I think that's the key. And you know your life best, and you know your schedule best, and thinking about where do we waste time, keeping a time journal, sometimes that's very helpful. And you can uh, steal five minutes here and there, here and there in your day, and it adds up. So how many of you had this experience? You thought, I will go on WhatsApp for five minutes, and then mindlessly scrolled on YouTube or even in WhatsApp for 30 minutes. How many of you have done that? OK, there's five honest people in this room. Good. And the rest of you, you also do it. You just are not admitting it. So right, this is how sometimes we squander time. And uh, thinking critically about that might help. This is a very long-winded answer. Did that answer your question? OK. OK. Any other questions, thoughts? Probably. One second. Akila Mataji wanted to say. said that um, her daughter is a preteen and she's going through a lot, meaning to others she's very nice, but within the family and my response and what her priority should be, I would the first thing I would say is welcome to parenthood, Mataji. Uh, that's a universal experience shared by every parent. Because sometimes when I read my children's progress reports from school and what the teacher has written about them, I think, really, really? 
This is the same child? Okay. Because, yeah, 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 from a kid's perspective, home is the place that they can be themselves, Mataji. So that, from that perspective, if you, if you think, they will be that true natural self at home and we have to give them that freedom, even though it drives us crazy. We still have to give them that freedom. Okay. And the second thing is, um, unlike mathematics or uh, science where you know what your child knows, you, you cover algebra and at the end of the year they take a test, if they get an A+, plus, you know they got the material. With Krishna Consciousness and Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam, you will know when they are 17 or 18. It's like planting a mango tree. For the first few years of after you plant a mango seed, nothing grows, a small dinky plant shows up. And then 10 years later it gives so many fruits that you're just in awe. Children are like that. So I think loving them unconditionally, although I don't do it, I'll say it first, my kids will call me out. Um, but trying to love them unconditionally, okay, but having faith in the process. As parents, we can only do so many things. We can provide facility, have a room, have plenty of proper books where they are accessible to children uh, and set an example. They, are the, they will be, I'm a, I'm, as a Sunday school teacher, I can tell this unequivocally. Children will be the first to call out hypocrisy when they see it, when what you say and what you do doesn't match. And children who are born here, they have this special power <laughs> to detect and call you out for it. Okay. So I would say uh, trust in the process. And it takes a village to raise a child. We are fortunate. We have this village, Prabhupada's village, Sri Prabhupada's family, and, and keep the dialogue going. And His Grace Kalkanta Prabhu one time said that in a conversation, whoever asks questions has the most power. So even when your children are acting out, just asking a simple open-ended conversation. Like, what happened? Why, why are you doing like this? Or what made you say that? What did the other person do? Um, if your sister, younger sister was going through this situation, how would you advise her? Once you ask children to give advice to someone, they become like Sama Pandita. They have so much wisdom to give. Okay, so just tapping into that and trusting in that process and also having one or two members outside the family that your child can go to. That is so key, Mataji. Because let's face it, when they are a teenager, they are not going to listen to us. Okay. But they might listen to someone else in the community. And if they, if they have that person, that's great. They don't have to listen. To, sometimes we are also wrong and we don't realize that. We are so blinded by emotion, we are also wrong. So having that additional people outside the family that the kid can go to, I think is the best thing we can do. Thank you. Yes, Rahul? Um, I just wanted to ask a question based on like, the applications of these qualities in different circumstances. Like, Shri Prabhupada was like, like a great example of that application. Like, obviously, he came to America at a really like, old age where he just couldn't give you and was not forced to read it and mercy for us. But he displayed that mercy in different ways. Like sometimes he was like more bold in his preaching because if he wasn't bold, people wouldn't take it seriously. But then other times he was more gentle in his preaching because that's what the like that, that's just what the situation required. So how exactly do we decide the way we should employ these qualities? Like, like how, how exactly? Like what are the indicators that show like how we should employ these qualities? What way we should show them? I'll answer your question when um, I ask more senior devotees to chime in. Uh, so the question is about how do we apply these qualities when Srila Prabhupada sometimes was very forceful in his preaching and sometimes was very gentle. Um, I think um, that also Srila Prabhupada also gave um, allowance for time, place and circumstance. And, and we, we have to remember the context in which Srila Prabhupada was in the 60s and 70s and also contrast that with our context here. In many ways Srila Prabhupada was far ahead of his time. Today, vegetarianism is well accepted. I can go to a conference and have a vegetarian option. But when Srila Prabhupada came, people thought if you were vegetarian, something was seriously wrong with you. And Srila Prabhupada allowed for that. He was far ahead of his time, simple living, high thinking, caring for the environment. Today, that's normal. 50 years ago, it was not normal. So sometimes when you are a visionary, some things which you say may not be understood by the rest. That doesn't mean you tone down your thing. But you also need to provide allowance for other people may not be at where you are and make them still feel welcome. 
not to, I think the key is not to be so judgmental that they are turned off from the process. We, our role is to bring people to Krishna. Our role is not to be this super uber judgmental person that they are afraid to come back to the temple. And so I think thinking about it in terms of, again, saying the truth in palatable ways, meeting people where they are. Think about, I, I'll just say from my own, before coming to Krishna consciousness, I was a totally different person. If someone, my, my own sister-in-law, if she was super judgmental, I don't think I would have felt wa welcomed and progressed. But she was very kind. She didn't criticize my eating habits and she accepted me the way I was. And that gave me space to grow. So I think making, giving people that space, but nevertheless not compromising on what Srila Prabhupada taught us. I think there is a way to do both and I think it comes with time and experience and skill. And also Prabhupada said, Thank you, Prabhu. One time, Prasanna Giriraj Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada asked Maharaj to go and distribute books and meet a lot of scientists and professors. And Maharaj asked, um, Prabhupada, sometimes you say they are uh, rascals and I forget the other term. Um, what should our mood be when we see them? And Prabhupada said, don't say any of that. You are going to that place. And be kind to them and leave them a good impression of you as a person. And then they'll be more receptive. So even in Prabhupada's time, that was the mood he told his disciples. We cannot repeat the statements that Srila Prabhupada said. His level of purity was different, ours is different. And, and when Prabhupada came, if you listen to some of the lectures, you can see, and many disciples have said that, Srila Prabhupada's English and accent was hard to understand. But one thing that they knew was he genuinely cared for them. And he knew that whatever he was saying was important. Right? He, Prabhupada used to cook for the people and all the people left and Prabhupada had to clean all the dishes in the kitchen. And so even though they didn't understand the language, they didn't understand who Krishna was, they knew that he was coming from a good place. And we have to ask ourselves, when we see people, do we have true compassion for them? Because if we did, then it would show. And our words will also come out right if our intent is clear. That's what it went back to that one of those verses. Sattva sam should be purity of one's existence. If our intention is pure, then the words will come out right. Did that answer? Thank you. Thank you very much.